Um, hello, everybody. My name is Nancy G, and I'm a lecturer in architectural design in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. I begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which this event is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the location of everyone. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So I'm joined by Dan Hill, Director of Melbourne School of Design, and we're delighted to welcome Summer Islam, who is a founding director of Material Cultures, an architecture and research practice founded to bring together design, material research, and strategic thinking to make meaningful progress towards a post-carbon built environment. So we already had a bit of a chat with Dan, but he had anything to add otherwise? Yeah. Oh, just to, um, just to welcome, summer as well and just say that we've been really um we're big fans of your work <laughs> we're really um inspired by the work that you've been doing i used to work at arab who you've worked with before i know the summer and um since when i got to melbourne about a year and a half ago i was sort of working with nancy and the faculty here on how do we re sort of pull our studio formats particularly in architecture apart a bit and begin to focus on different areas within the curriculum of an architect and we have three sets of studios and the third one really that Nancy is looking after is heavily to do with materiality and material and beginning to get into um, circular material processes, regenerative environments, biomaterials and these kinds of aspects. And when we look around, I think the work that Material Cultures is doing is um, really at the forefront of that globally. And so thank you for that amazing work. It's uh, really powerful and um, triggering all kinds of conversations here. So I'm going to um, hand back to Nancy now and I'll, I'll slip into the background description. Thanks, Dan. Um, just a really quick note that, um, that we hopefully do have a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So for the audience to please put any questions, submit them in the Q&A button. So otherwise, I'll hand it over to Summer. Nice. Thank you so much, guys, for um, a kind introduction. And thank you for having me. In Material Cultures, we're a, a research and design practice, and we work at the intersection of natural materials and low body carbon construction and construction technology. And through our work in different ways, we advocate for material reform and construction um, through design and research and also through education projects. And this is because we believe that a transition to a greener economy is not just possible, but urgently necessary, that with that transition comes the opportunity to rethink the material cultures that surround us. We design buildings uh, which work to integrate bio-based materials and many, many processed minerals into efficient construction systems which are adapted for contemporary modes of fabrication. And we carry out strategic research into how these ideas could be applied at scale and critically how they relate to you a broader move towards, on the one hand, a circular economy, and on the other hand, regenerative land management practices. We teach at Central St. Martins, the Architectural Association, and the London School of Architecture to explore these agendas more broadly and also to expand access to post-carbon thinking within education. And we work very laterally across different scales and disciplines from developing materials to large-scale housing developments like this project um, in Lewis on the south coast of England. And recently we published and co-authored a book with Amma Kadal called Material Reform, which assembles a series of essays exploring the cultures and systems, infrastructures um, that shape the architectural industry and also the destructive ecologies that it fosters. So 200 years ago, fossil fuel based technologies shifted the majority of human societies into a new era based on easy access to cheap energy and massively accelerating our capacity to transform our environment. This facilitated practices from industrial agriculture and mass deforestation through to mining, dredging and landforming. This process has been shaped by colonialist and capitalist practices characterized by violence, violence to ecosystems and to landscapes, to human and non-human populations. The contemporary construction industry is entirely dependent on these practices. An abundance of cheap oil fuels defines not only the production of the materials we use, but also the machines that extract the raw materials and the lorries, ships and railways that transport them. Yeah, so most contemporary buildings are directly dependent on uh, fossil fuel products from polyurethane and polystyrene insulation, uh, spray foam like you see here and composite panelling, uh, plastic ground sheets and sticky tape. And the majority of the buildings which are made by fossil fuels are repetitive and anonymous 
and they have a material language which is the product of a macho culture which prizes power and permanence and resistance to change. They retain no trace of the social and ecological processes which brought them into being and have an apparent immortality about them which is little but a daydream. The building fabrics act as an integrated whole and are highly vulnerable to single points of failure and hard, if not impossible, to repair and maintain. Most of them fail to even make it to middle age and they're demolished after less than 25 years of use. Where they do persist is in landfill. The construction industry accounts for 60% of all waste generated in the UK and petrochemical derived products can cause continued harm over thousands of years as they break down and leach pollutants and microplastics into the biosphere. Our best hope for renewing architecture is renewing its relationship with the land. Our centuries-old habit of using the land in ways which degrade our soil and waterways and ecosystems needs not just to be halted, but to be reversed. And the key to this reversal is regenerative land management practices. Rather than making demands based on abstract ideas about what we want, we start instead by asking what the land needs and what a healthy and regenerative set of land uses can produce. The most pressing task for architecture is to balance the needs of the land with the needs of construction, developing infrastructures and technologies and materials that can bring the two back into carefully managed interdependence. To achieve these, more equitable approaches to the distribution and use of land needs to be developed, which consider the needs of the community, the lives of people working the land and the structure of regional economies. Land use isn't planned based on the needs of the economy and the biosphere, but based on historical usage patterns a hab of habit and a patchwork of law and policy from the last 400 years. Half of the British uh, land mass is used for the relatively luxurious pursuit of growing or uh, growing feedstock for animals or grazing animals themselves. And only 20% is used for arable farming and dense urban centres combined. So a shift away from extractivist economies would mean halting the pervasive culture of demolition and moving towards a culture of repair. We need to develop ways not just to build with regenerative materials, but also to integrate them into existing structures. And a regenerative approach to both resource and infrastructure would mean significantly more the workforce engaged in land work and in the maintenance and repair of built infrastructure through planned cyclic replacement. Is we need to transform not only how we look after buildings in the land, but how we think about them, shifting both towards a culture of care. And to make meaningful change in the construction industry, we need to accept that there aren't any easy answers and that all construction practices cause harm and all require compromise. So moving forward, architects have to back sources and supply chains and draw on the knowledge and experience across many other industries, other disciplines and other fields of study to incrementally establish which compromises we can accept and in which the harm outweighs the good. So we have to reimagine, we think, how we use land at a local, regional and national scale, but also this offers us a chance for economic and social renewal, refiguring how we live together on the land. I'm gonna speak about our work now through um, three different scales, uh, through the scale of the land and the scale of the building, um, as well as the scale of the individual. So in refiguring our design processes to align with ecological principles, we ask what forms of coexistence and productivity are possible within the existing systems on the land and how the different forms of production and extraction interact with a carbon cycle. This informs how and what we build. Whilst we have long understood land as a finite resource, we have treated soil as an infinitely, as an essentially infinite one. Regenerative approaches to construction see the soil as something that is vulnerable to degradation through misuse. As the largest terrestrial sources, stores of carbon, we need to treat our soils as resources which are just as precious as our other national, natural capital. Our research along the supply chains of the materials we specify has taken us to the different landscapes in which bio-based materials can be cultivated. And it's in the woods and fields and wetlands that we've begun to explore the consequences of this cultivation for the environment and for the people who work the land, as well as for the non-human species that depend on it. Recently, we've been uh, researching wetland ecosystems, and it's in the wetlands we've explored uh, the interrelationship of landscape conservation and production for the construction industry. Um, the case study site we've been looking at is in uh, the Sernitz Lowlands near Greifenberg in Germany, where in the 19th century, uh, the wetlands were drained uh, to access their fertile peat soils for agriculture. In order to protect the biodiversity of these landscapes and the carbon stored within the peat, 
and enable it to slowly regenerate. Projects in the region are slowly beginning to resaturate the farmland there. This map shows all of the wetland across um, Germany, where the German government plans to um, resaturate 50,000 hectares of wetland a year. But at the moment, they only achieve about 1,000. So projects just like this one in the Sarnitz wetlands we've been looking at is a pilot for restoration across Germany, um, as well as for the floodplains and wetlands that we have across the globe. So saturating a wetland is carried out through non-human or human intervention, a kind of series of different uh, mechanisms like uh, blocking up land drains and ditches, reintroducing beavers, um, filling them with peat. Um, so allowing the kind of um, water table to rise slowly, but also the plants and crops which used to grow there um, to replenish and introducing uh, blockages through gates and, and beaver dams. Um, essentially what happens is the ecosystems uh, that are very precious on these wetlands uh, can be restored. And as the sediment and debris in the ground builds up, uh, stores of carbon build up too. And this is um, pretty important for um, making sure the carbon sequestration from our landscapes is um, being retained, but also that the ecosystems with them, um, within them can continue um, to thrive. Uh, and in some cases, critically, they're kind of being reintroduced where those ecosystems have failed. In flooding these former wetlands, agricultural practices of the last decades have to be replaced with other productivity, uh, which supports tenant farmers who work the lands in new ways. So, for example, we're taking away the cultivation of um, sheep and cattle, um, as well as like wheat and other vegetables being grown on the site. But in Sinets, um, these can be replaced by farmed water buffalo, um, which uh, have physiognomy. Um, which is ideally suited to the wetlands. They have wide hooves. Um, they're kind of happy living in the wetland context and they graze back um, the growth of bushes and woody plants, which keeps the wetland open, which is very important for the ecosystem. The project like this are invaluable um, for retaining kind of the critical carbon stores within wetland, um, whose peat continues to off gas when the landscape is dry. In, in our research collaboration with Bauhaus Earth, who are the funders of this project in Germany, we've been looking at, at the relationship between conservation and construction, or how conservation of landscapes can feed the construction industry in sustainable and productive ways. Specifically in this context, how reeds and other polluted culture crops could be cultivated in this region and across our global wetlands to the benefit of the farmer and the landscape. Harvesting reed, for example, um, leaves the very carbon heavy root systems in the ground, but the practice of hard practice of harvesting encourages those root systems to deepen and develop, which enables multiple croppings of reed a year, um, but also uh, forces the carbon deeper into the soil. And there are a number of different manufacturers in the region, um, farmers and conservationists, who are working to understand how the material supply chain there can be supported to grow and scale. Um, and we've been exploring how as architects we can specify and promote these new materials, which are alternatives to plasterboard, um, OSB and foam-based insulations used with grasses and crops um, harvested from the wetland. Uh, reed and sedge, for example, which grow in wetland um, are very quick growing grasses. They have very long standing uses in the construction industry across um, the globe, but specifically in the UK with the practice of thatching. Um, reed mats are also used as substrates for rendering in traditional building practice. Um, and the, these practices in construction have declined alongside the decline of our wetlands, you know, as our wetlands have de depleted and been dried up, the way we've built our buildings has changed as a consequence. Um, but the demand for those materials hasn't completely dissipated. Um, but as our wetlands have uh, depleted, we now import those materials from other places. So water reed is imported um, across Europe from Turkey, Hungary, and Poland. But as restoration of these landscapes picks up across the globe, we think there's an opportunity for more regionally distributed uh, manufacturing materials um, to develop as well. So all these different uh, grasses, stalks and straws essentially uh, are materials which are really naturally suited to insulating our buildings. And when you grow um, them sustainably in landscapes like this, which can naturally regenerate, they actively sequester carbon into the landscape and also um, into our buildings. Moving into the woods and woodlands, um, we see a natural role for straw and grasses in the insulation of our buildings. But for our structures, we look to timber and then to the woodlands in which our trees are grown. With the critical role that timber is going to play in the decarbonisation of the global economy, 
and achieving net zero, the question of how the growing demand for wood is met is ever pressing. So much of this demand uh, looks to be met by engineered timber products. Um, and these are generally speaking formed of softwoods. Monoculture plantations like these can deplete our soils. They're nutrient hungry and clear felling disturbs the soils detrimentally. But this approach to the industrialization of our forestry practices is driven by demands for high yields and fast growing softwood trees, um, like Sitka spruce, for example, uh, grown in plantations just like this um, to feed the construction industry. As monocultures um, with limited biodiversity within their understories, they have very little resilience in the face of climate change. If one tree um, goes down, sometimes the whole forest might. Our research speculates on what our landscapes might look like if we planned our forests and forestry practices around the needs of the soil rather than the needs of the industry, and consequently what building cultures could emerge um, from this different approach. We've been working um, at the Design Museum in London last year as design ecosystem fellows investigating the opportunities for resilient treescapes and regenerative land use management practices to be employed to repair our degraded landscapes and also the societies and economies that live within them. We've been speculating on a future land use model which isn't confined to a risk averse market determined by the fossil fuel economy, a kind of mosaic alternative to monoculture landscape management in which arable land is woven alongside short rotation forestry. Or for example, quick growing coppiced hazel and willow and shelter belt to broadleaf tree species, which um, become kind of home to a host of different um, plants and animals within their understory. Our research has been exploring how to work with the materials and products which might be drawn from a more diverse form of treescape continuous color models, which mix different sorts of trees. Um, we've also been engaging positively with the complex challenges that this presents, looking at how we would need to build infrastructure across the country, um, building regional sawmills and timber processes, places where you could structurally grade your timber and air dry it and from which it could be distributed. We've been looking at the um, production of prototypical and experimental structures. And we collaborated on these with some of our students at Central St. Martins drawing from materials that grow in the woodlands today and also speculating on materials which might be cultivated in landscape in the decades to come. This is a prototype um, built using eucalyptus timber, for example, and these are experiments exploring uh, how the leaves and different parts of the um, tree can be used in construction. So these alternative models of um, cultivation of, I guess, wetland and also woodland and might be lower yield. Um, and I suppose what we're exploring is how in a sustainable future, the construction industry would need to adapt to these landscape systems, um, which might be mixes of arable and uh, woodland, like agroforestry systems that you see here, where you have trees growing in rows alongside arable crops, um, which create their own kind of um, climate um, within a kind of localized piece of land. Um, but they ultimately also supply food crops um, like wheat, but also insulation through straw and hemp. In the UK, we import a huge quantity of the timber we consume, it's 80%, um, and we have very little forest cover um, within the country itself. Very little of the woodland we have is, is sustainably managed, and most of it's privately owned. Um, so whilst we look to grow more trees, we also need to understand better how they're managed um, and what the policy incentives are for people to keep the woodlands we have in really good condition. So it's buildings like this now, which we think we need to question because evidence suggests that as the supply and demand for engineered timber grows, global biodiversity will decline um, at a kind of equivalent rate, which is very alarming. We have scarce forestry resources and the ecosystems they support are very valuable. Every time we fell forests to make products and buildings, we need to be using those resources as efficiently as possible, using the timber to make lean and lightweight building frames. I guess within a British landscape context, the kind of final piece of our mosaic puzzle is the arable and pastoral landscape, which has, you know, a lot to offer the construction industry in many ways in a kind of more conventional model. Um, we've done some research in the UK, particularly in the northeast and Yorkshire of the country, looking at grazing practices and industrial farming and how they've transformed the landscape, um, obliterating hedgerows and depleting soils. And we've also been looking at how material industries there 
um, are beginning to develop around a kind of bio-based construction world, um, which goes hand in hand with the, an agroecological revolution. We've worked with Arup, uh, which Dan was mentioning, um, who are kind of research partners in this project, looking at establishing kind of complex, regional and resilient bio-based material industries here. Um, and we looked at kind of what's limiting that uptake of those materials in construction now and, and what could happen in the future to make that um, more possible. Especially as um, farmers today are increasingly shifting their practices to be more diverse, partly to be economically resilient, partly to be resilient um, in other ways um, to climate change. The bringing more crops in closer proximity to one another um, gives more revenue streams, but also has like benefits for ecology and biodiversity and suggests a new way of cultivating our land. Um, which the construction industry would need to respond to. But bio-based materials um, or the, the feedstocks from which they're grown can be cultivated um, in this way too. So hemp, for example, is a very good part of a rotation system in an agroecological model. It has very deep tap roots. Um, it helps restore soil carbon and it doesn't need pesticides. So it's a very good um, kind of piece of a broader landscape puzzle. One of the considerations that we've had in all of this research is like how you balance the opportunity cost of using land to grow materials against um, the need to grow food and also um, in a very small island like ours, um, the need for housing. The region that we've been exploring in the UK, uh, Yorkshire and the Northeast plans to build 500,000 new homes by 2038 and they need to retrofit about 4 million buildings. Um, and very simply, the material demands this puts on the industry are absolutely enormous. We would need huge quantities of insulation. And embodied carbon terms using a classic uh, pallet materials to do that, we would need, it would generate something like 26 million tonnes of carbon just to build those houses. Um, and so we looked at what it might mean to build those houses in a different way with these bio-based materials and what the environmental impact of that is, which is uh, very significant because every house made of plant-based materials sequesters 198% um, of the carbon relative to the bio-based, uh, the business as usual model uh, used, using brick and concrete block. So a kind of local level on a house by house um, model, the environmental impact is very clear. We also looked at how much land you need to grow these homes to meet the housing need. And we found um, that it was fractional really considering how much growing there already is but also that the economic benefits um, to the, this very deindustrialized de region of the country would be really extraordinary and in, in the kind of billions of pounds. In the end, it's always the cultures and regulatory frameworks, the mortgages and insurances, kind of knowledge and skills gaps, which are the real barriers to change. And so it's there that we're now focusing our energy and some of the teaching work we're doing, looking at um, skills provision um, through the um, our new um, material culture is called MC Make. So we believe that by actively participating and provoking dialogue between all these disparate arms of the construction industry and other industries beyond our own, um, we can address the, more, the most pressing question, let's say, in the built environment today, which is the tension between the landscapes and sites on which we build and the conditions in the fields and quarries, forests and factories that we take the materials from to do that. So in this frame, you could start to read, I suppose, the landscape or a site as a starting point for a supply chain and develop the logic from a building from, from that kind of landscape upwards. So if we begin with the smallest scale of the unit, um, at this community farm site we have in North London, um, this um, organization provides food for, it provides space for food growing and enterprise and it's at the heart of a movement towards reducing disparity in access to the land. And the buildings that we've been working on there have been designed to be constructed with community participation, cultivating agency and an ongoing relationship with care. The project will provide new buildings for learning, distributing and coming together. And they're set around a series of courtyards. So um, the site, as we inherited it, was surrounded by a wall of uh, Leylandii trees which are a fast growing softwood species often planted in the UK in order to create dense boundaries. Um, they're very popular in suburban England along the back of people's homes and gardens. They have a very high resin content, uh, Leylandii, which makes them suitable for external use. 
but the trees have little habitat value and they were being removed to open up the site to bring light back in um, to the buildings and to the growers. So rather than chipping the trees um, and turning them to kind of biomass, the design incorporates the resulting timber into outdoor furniture and expressive external columns that frame the courtyard um, of the buildings. As the crow flies in London, there are the kind of landscape is like 21% trees. And many of these are very high quality hardwoods actually. Together with the many unmanaged woodlands, these trees are part of a bigger narrative about how the loss of smaller scale timber industries and the processing and distributing infrastructure that accompanied them um, has been kind of detrimental to the way we conceive of and make buildings. The site um, already had a very thick concrete slab on it, um, which was cast over the majority of the growing site. And we, so we've been removing this in part to create permeable landscaping, which has re resulted in tons of rubble, um, which has gone back into the design of the new foundations for the buildings, which are just kind of rough trenches. So we just cut big channels in the soil and then the rubble goes back into them. And then that's capped with a, um, a brick ring beam. So there's no new concrete and no steel. Much like um, the most of London's um, sites, um, the building sits on a kind of substrate of clay. And so excavations for the trenches will require over 100 meters cubed of clay to be removed. In Europe, the soil excavation for construction produces five times the volume of household waste. And it's usually disposed of as landfill. But in this instance, the clay will travel 30 miles to Buckinghamshire, where it will be thrown into molds and turned into unfired bricks known as strocks. Um, you can see an example of a kind of strock wall here being used um, to form internal walls and partitions. And the site itself is linked to a number of other peri-urban farms from which we intend to source straw in the form of bales, um, which we will use to construct and insulate the walls. Um, we think there's a very clear case for developing the use of straw as a building material. Straw was very common in construction in the UK for thousands of years. It was used to make walls and roofs and to insulate um, and to reinforce buildings as well. When it's really well detailed, it can remain stable in buildings for hundreds of years. And at the end of its useful lifetime, it can just be mulched or added to compost. The structure of our building at Walls Lane has been designed um, with a lightweight timber frame made from what are called C16 timbers rather than the higher C24 grade. So we've been looking, I think, essentially at the limitations of um, what sorts of trees grow in the UK? They're generally slightly weaker in structural terms, they're the lower grade. But by specifying explicitly um, lower structural grade timbers, we can be relatively certain they're being sourced from within the island. So this allows the timber to come from a broader spectrum of species and also to come from smaller local sawmills and that have a very different capacity. Um, and when we need um, uh, reinforcing junctions between the, the softwood pieces of timber, we're using hardwoods as plates rather than steel. So these principles, like you know, working with what you already have, thinking cyclically, using bio-based materials where possible, and responding to seasonality, being resourceful, they're applicable in any context. This approach re-establishes a relationship to place and people, and models a slower and more careful way of building. And we think this project shows how the units of construction and their supply chains can often be woven together from the material threads that already exist on the site itself. In Europe alone constructs an average of one and a half million homes a year. The carbon cost of this is really staggering. On the other hand, the carbon sequestered in bio-based materials means that when we build with plants, we can see our buildings as carbon stores or kind of carbon batteries. And the more plant-based materials we use, whether it's straw or timber, that we can integrate into our new build buildings or retrofitted buildings, uh, the bigger this carbon store globally can be. In order for material reform to be meaningful, these systems need to compete in efficiency and cost with the ubiquitous concrete block and kingspan and rock wall. And so we've been looking in our work at how we take those individual material components and put them together into systems. Um, systems which can be substituted for the kind of more conventionally understood ones with using the existing skills that are already there. So for example, wood fiber insulation that you see in this picture and like lime render, um, they're kind of direct substitutions for existing materials on the construction market. I talked a bit about hemp already in a kind of landscape context, but 
we've been using hemp in a lot of our buildings as well um as well as being a, a very effective carbon sequestration kind of forest in in a field um very, being very good at rehabilitating soil um the stem of the plant can be separated into two different elements both of which have uses in construction so we have the stalk of the plant and also the fiber around the edges and the woody core um is known as shiv and that gets mixed up with lime to make hempcrete um which doesn't have structural strength but is an excellent insulator with very good thermal mass and um the addition of the lime binding means that it's very fire resistant and its hygroscopic qualities help to regulate the humidity in the air and we've been exploring different ways of applying um hempcrete in construction from in situ cast hempcrete that you see here which has very beautiful um kind of striation and strata um from the shuttering and lifts of the hempcrete um to working with it in block form which has a kind of other advantages the skill level um the skills needed kind of could come from a, a masonry builder and they they're not particularly specialist um other than needing to understand how to work with lime plaster um but also there's a kind of i guess an expedient and efficiency to working with things in block form and we've also been developing prefabricated systems where hempcrete gets introduced to timber cassettes um and then the whole thing can be the whole building can essentially be craned in place um, in a number of days. Um, that was essentially um, an integral part of the process of developing a project of ours called Flat House, um, which began actually with sowing the seed for the hemp in the field next to the building, which was then harvested at the end of the summer. So we um, cultivated 20 acres of hemp, which produced enough shiv to insulate the prefabricated system of the cassettes that were developed for the project. And the cassettes were installed across two very muddy days with simple tools and very simple technology. The house itself is a two-story farmhouse that takes the volume of an uh, existing barn, utilizing the remaining steel frames to form a south-facing hothouse. And it's clad in a biocomposite sheet made from hemp fiber grown on the land. Um, and a bioresin, which mixed with the hemp fiber, um, which is a product that was developed um, especially for the project. Internally, the cassette system in hemp is left exposed, so you can read the monolithic nature of the wall, um, which is, a, um, we think, a timeless, um, but also a very special spatial quality. Um, and there are big, open, um, very well-lit sp well spaces, which um, shift um, towards sort of smaller and more intimate ones and give you a change in the structural register of the building. And upstairs there is a mezzanine which opens onto a terrace and there are views uh, across the fields um, from which the hemp was grown. I guess for us one of the most important things about this project is at the end of its life uh, these materials could all be reused or ultimately they could be returned to the ground in, form, in the form of compost and um, so they would return to the carbon cycle and also improve the soil. But what's missing from this perfect story, uh, I think, is how you grow a building from the fields that surround it. Um, um, is the reality in, in the British kind of manufacturing industry, the kind of absence of lots of the infrastructure that we need um, to grow the industry that we envision. So between the harvest of the hemp and the erection of the building, the hemp itself did a lap around the country um, in order for it to be processed and prefabricated before it came back uh, to Margent Farm, which is the, the site. And that's because um, there isn't the, the kind of hemp processing infrastructure distributed across the country. It's very specialized equipment, which is yet um, to kind of grow in, in demand um, and to scale. So although the house is carbon negative and achieved a five star energy performance rating, the infrastructure to facilitate its production at scale doesn't really exist. So scaling up requires investment in bioregional infrastructure. <laughs> for processing and also for manufacturing. And the promotion of these low carbon materials through incentives and taxes. Um, so whilst this will come at a cost, in the context of the final warning from the IPCC and construction's primary role in climate breakdown, it's important to ask ourselves what the human cost will be if we don't fundamentally change the way we build. I'll finish by talking about the kind of larger scale at which we're trying to work now, which is um, I guess at the scale of the development or the town or city. In the, in the south of England, uh, in a town called Lewis, we're working on a project to deliver 70 units uh, over four residential blocks as part of a 700 home development. 
The Phoenix Project is being led by developers Human Nature, and it's trying to set a new precedent for genuinely sustainable development. The buildings are three to five stories tall, and they're designed to be constructed from timber, hemp, chalk, and lime. They're a very dense urban configuration and arranged to share uh, courtyards intersected with pedestrianised streets. Walking and cycling are privileged over driving, and all residents have access to a transport hub with cargo bikes and car shares. Our proposals look at a lightweight timber frame system constituted um, of softwood cassettes, like the one we used at Flat House, um, infilled again with hempcrete and lime. With this project in particular, the timber um, is being sourced from a consortium of local sawmills, which is in itself an endeavour. Um, the developers have been working um, ye years in advance, really, the construction to source and establish the stocks that they need from the supply chain uh, local to them. Um, so that timber is being um, sourced, selected, dried off site to be seasoned. And the idea there is to reduce the cost of the supply, but also to remove the need for high energy kiln drying and remove the risks and inconsistencies of working with those small scale supply chains. And the project really demonstrates, uh, we think what's possible when you start working at a larger scale. And we hope when it's built, um, that it will be a kind of true demonstrator of what, um, what we need and also what can be achieved in a decarbonized construction industry. Large scale developments that are explicitly led by ecological procurement principles could produce scales of efficiency that reduce the cost of these materials and fast track the supply chain development in a way without these larger scale developments um, the undertaking of shifting to bio-based construction will always be the cost of ourselves as architects uh, the client and their kind of intent um, for change and and often the manufacturing contractor as well these projects are attempts um, to make architecture that is descriptive of a bio region as well as, in, as infrastructure develops so can the specificity of material and architectural language um, and we hope that with that, you could begin to see the reversal of the supply chain logic, which produced um, the international style. So we recognize that working with non-standard materials sets you outside of most of the infrastructures that support and regulate construction, which means that designers and builders are held more accountable for the decisions that they make. But currently the only option is for designers, builders and clients um, to take on significantly more responsibility and risk. But making buildings allows us to engage in a slow, determined practice of reform, finding ways to adjust and reorientate existing structures, economies and technical knowledge to try and produce outcomes which demonstrate different ways of creating and maintaining the built environment and not just necessary, but they are possible. And I'll finish up there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thama. And I had to rush through it, but I think it's a great overview of a lot of the great projects and so many different materials. Um, we have a few questions already. I'm not sure if you can see them as well, um, but I'll give you a moment to just maybe recover. I'm just... <laughs> sorry, I did that. Break net speed. Let me um, open up chat. Oh, good. Um, maybe just as a... Um, if initial question, because a lot of the students in the audience are taking the Design Studio E class and they've just finished their mid-semester presentation, so we're kind of halfway through. And mm -hmm. the next, the second half of the semester, um, we're really hoping the students can start to get into more details, right? And appreciate you showed a lot of not just drawings, but even models, like one to one models of detail as as well. And mm -hmm. I guess just wondering if we have advice like for a student who's about to you know develop more thought about what materials to choose or you know a lot of this design research you've done shows how a lot of it is a research part of it and a lot of it is testing and experimenting um but say you know in the next six weeks for a student to try to you know realistically try to engage as much as they can um mm -hmm. as an educator yourself as well do you have any thoughts on that moving forward for them Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> Maybe just a few sentences. <laughs> I know it's it's very complicated. I suppose, um, no, it, you know, what I really valued about being a student was having the kind of agency to tackle things um, in the way that I was interested in and excited to to do as well. Um, 
and maybe it's, it's difficult to kind of extricate myself from my own personal experience of being a student and also how I work in practice but I have found then and I still find that thinking about things through different scales and trying stuff out myself um, has always been a most joyful but also the um, maybe most valuable part of the learning experience like I think if you're working in your design through thinking about some materials there is no substitute for using them yourself in something even if that's not directly in your in a model or a one-to-one prototype because I you know those things can be expensive but wherever you have an opportunity to to try things and learn I think because it's so easy to be removed from a kind of embodied understanding of what it is to be on a construction site and like no, there's nothing you know working on a model is not going to come close to the kind of uh, the, maybe the tedium and labor of working on a building that you know the same actions happen again and again and your day um, really isn't broken from the monotony but I think it's important to understand that that's part of what it is to make buildings and we're part of the supply chain of instructing that work um mm. but also that there are moments of joy in releasing that that you know it's it's great to understand I think and and that they don't always do what you want them to do and that's also part of it um yeah I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> maybe I can um select one of the ones in the chat to save you the time of having to read them as well but um because there was there was one that as you were talking I was thinking about and it and it's similar to Luke Costello's question here which is you're describing a, um, a very different kind of practice one that's moving mm -hmm. across ecology um understanding agriculture understanding local culture as well as practicalities of building and making and spatial practices architecture um how how much of the practice is architects or reformed architects or architects that are unlearning their trade um or do you have mm. work with ecologists and agricultural mm. experts as well luke was specifically asking did you have a background in architecture or did you begin your studies in a different no, no. I'm how, a, do you, I'm an how do you come to that and how does the practice get there <laughs> yeah no we are we are in fact almost all uh architects by background mm. um we but we do work a lot with with our, you know people from other disciplines with other skills you know I'm not an ecologist I work with ecologists on our research projects that's one of the great joys of our research actually is the um the ability to bring in different expertise and to kind of fund that work and those conversations it's a really special thing um yeah we've all come I think to to our work through maybe an engagement with architecture and then looking at how it could be something beyond maybe what it was when we were studying but that's changing mm. as well I think you know my experience of architectural education is very different from what architectural education is is like today mm. and so maybe you know what brought us all to material cultures is different um at least between the three of us um directors but ultimately I think it was a frustration with how things um were mm. um how things are in a construction site and how things are as a for us as individual architects you know the limits of our agency the limits of our um scope and also the the kind of powerlessness of some of some of the role and then mm. th this isn't to say that what we do um is driven by and looking for more control but it is looking for more agency to improve things i think um yeah but no i'm i'm a proper architect <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than i am um so <laughs> I think maybe another question, and then Nancy, you feel free to pick one as well. I'm just going to try and summarize the first one because there's a it's a good long question about the which I think I think you get it in your presentation, mm -hmm. um, but about the systemic challenges sort of built into the practices and a couple of points that you made as you were going, maybe head in this direction. As in, you started looking at things like mortgage products and insurance mm -hmm. and to sort of. Mm -hmm what I would call the dark matter around the matter, as in the stuff yeah. that makes it work or not. Um, yeah. So so the question really was about that, about how do architects inspire systemic change, given the inherent issues, issues at the moment with sourcing materials kind of baked into the current system? Do you sort of move yeah. around it? Do you, how many, how many sort of things are you trying to take on simultaneously? Yeah, um, too many, too many things. <laughs> And that that is, I, I I think we do try and take on sometimes too many things at the same time. But the uh, reality is it's a very complex, uh, it's a complex set of issues that limit practice um, and that limit practice more sustainably. So 
it's, it's sort of hard not to try and be aware of all of them, but we aren't actually uh, able maybe to address them all one at a time. But yeah, mort mortgages and insurances, like that would be a life's work to yeah. try and change those infrastructures. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm interested in being part of that work. I don't think I have capacity to, to give everything to it because there are, there's another problem over here that I'm also trying to have some consciousness of. Um, but I think Passive House is a really ex interesting example that um, anonymous attendee number one raised. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I think we have, um, where we have lots of um, issues and questions around maybe the use of Passive House and um, it's kind of like a, a, another system of gatekeeping. It's quite expensive to build a passive house because of the certification process. You have to use loads of different like products to plug up holes that aren't sustainable inherently in themselves. There's loads of embodied carbon sometimes in those buildings. And so we, we sort of don't, maybe, maybe in that case, we sidestep to answer your question. Like we just, we don't do it. We say to our clients, like we'd like to get your house to a form family as well as we can, yeah. as close to passive house in some ways as we can. We probably won't do it the passive house way we'll do it another way and yeah how can we inspire systemic change i think that's a really complex question i think every time you build a building which is a bit better than the last one you you saw and went to that is really helpful and people underestimate how few examples there are if we're trying to demonstrate to clients that something is it's perfectly fine to use it's been used loads to find an example of it which is contemporary beautiful and still standing it's quite difficult actually and so every time you do use one of those materials in that way in a way which kind of is aspirational inspirational to people uh, it really does build a i don't know a body of evidence i think mm. yeah absolutely thank you nancy do you want to yeah i saw a question that i think you kind of started to talk about at the end summer about scaling up some of the projects mm -hmm. so the question from steve was um sort of asking about density and then you know you're saying the need for more housing the need to densify and also the need mm -hmm. to grow food so land is very valuable but also mm -hmm. you know to you know to be able to save a lot of the native agricultural land as well um did you have any um thoughts yeah on you know building yeah. natural materials but they're limited in their ability for height or density yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And I suppose we started some of our research from that question, you know, like, well, we need to build as tall as we can. They're limited in building code. Um, how do we tackle that problem? And the work we did in Yorkshire was about literally just answering housing need in kind of policy terms. Like they said they wanted to build this many homes. We looked mm -hmm. at whether or not it could be done. And it could be done, but, you know, it's still a kind of alarming undertaking, isn't it? But the reality is that also if you sort of step back and you just don't look at that problem on its own and you look at like, let's say housing in the country and the systems of infrastructure around ownership of land and housing. In the UK, there are a million more homes than we need to house our population in an extraordinarily comfortable, you know, larger square meters per person ratio than has ever existed in history. And that is because quite a lot of the homes we own are owned by a few people. A lot of the land is in the hands of a few landowners and lots of people own more than one house and it's bigger than, you know, need. Like, you need is obviously hard to define, but the answer is there are plenty of bedrooms. So actually, although, you know, there's a kind of limitation to what you can do with bio-based buildings en masse for kind of new build housing, I think the answer really is like, well, we're not really advocating building like hundreds of new cities. We're kind of advocating improving the building stock we already have with these materials. Um but also it's it's we're in a kind of transitionary time. So, you know, we can push that, but like, until policy catches up and uh, social consciousness around that that issue, I think to demonstrate that new build buildings can be done better is also part of it. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, I sometimes think of it as an exercise in, in I don't know, like pol politics, <laughs> just uh, talking about the things that maybe people are responding to. But in the, in the long term, I'm more interested in how you, improve the buildings we have and change structures in society to make it possible for us to share them in different ways. No, I think that I totally agree. It's um it's exactly the same in Australia. I can tell you there's lots of empty buildings. Um, okay. um something like 40% of all of the houses in Australia have one, if not two, spare rooms completely empty. You know, so yeah, there's lots exactly. of space to be redistributed already. And you know, we're looking, well, we're in the middle of um 
we're in the middle of a global population slowdown and heading towards the end of that by the 2050s, yeah. 2060s. So the, I think the need to um, to make the very tall buildings is really serving the interests of capital rather than anything else. Uh, and I was struck by your Lewis project, um, just that kind of two-story, three-story, four-story kind of Mm. feeling i mean that's it that's that's what's we're missing here in melbourne for instance it's not yeah it's not 60 story towers it's just three story walk-ups <laughs> yeah which could be done completely in bio-based materials it seems to me yeah 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 i mean the limit here is five five stories and that's actually because of the uh fire code around timber yeah or the use of timber at height which and you know across here it really varies quite wildly what building yeah. codes allow and don't allow but here we have you know, yeah. the legacy of the Great Fire of London and um, the kind of tragedies of things like Grenfell Tower, which uh, weirdly didn't like change building code around using Kingspan. <laughs> no, there's it's not a lot harder of, to build not a lot of building. material in that, wasn't it? <laughs> no. no so, um, I'll ask another question by Andre Benice, actually, who's on faculty here. Uh, so it's not just students in tonight. But um, he's asking about this relationship between maintenance and care and then the production of the building and maybe what andrea is getting at is you know do you do you understand from a design process think mm -hmm. how can we choose the materials such that they could be maintained and cared or yeah. are you starting with materials and then thinking through maintenance and care because it really is strongly that you were really looking at the local environment the trades that are happening there the craft production that's there the materials that are there locally as a, as a continuous process is that is that right yeah yeah i think absolutely and um having i especially having built a few buildings now with the material palette, I think we're very attuned to um, like maybe extra alert to issues around maintenance and with some of these materials, because, you know, we might be introducing um, a client to something new they haven't come across before and it needs to be something that they could look after themselves other than, unless we're stressing that, you know, extraordinary cost for repair. And broadly speaking, that's the good thing about plant-based materials and working with clay or lime, you know, they're not, um, they are not inherently uh, complex skills if you wanted to do a bit of repair work on a patch mm. of your wall or a little bit of your floor they're quite safe things to work with to add clay in and to kind of fill a gap where you might have I don't know changed your mind about where a painting was you know those sorts of things they're not really inherently different from like a plasterboard wall where you get kind of polyfiller but it mm. doesn't come in a tube premix mm. you know you just have to get your own and figure it out um but actually some of our some of the um kind of builders and like craft people we work with will have kind of handover packages for their clients you know like they leave a bit of clay behind and they're like you just need to fill it if ever you need a bit more it's relatively straightforward and it is really integral to how we think about design because you know there are finishes we like the look of but we know that some clients find them harder to maintain and so you know we always go in with that as part of the conversation like you could do this this and this the maintenance around these things is different in these ways um but generally speaking uh it's actually so far touch wood not been an issue like nothing has fallen off <laughs> fallen down uh fallen apart just yet um mm. but i think it is it's really important i think that's the for us it was a big part of the start of material cultures was like working with materials that people could then adapt themselves um i think it's an important question and this idea that like you know flats today if you were a tenant and you're not a freeholder and you're you know you don't own the place you live in you're not really allowed to make holes in the walls it's a bit like mm. a macbook you know as soon as you open it up you've sort of broken the kind of warranty and you can't mm. maintain it and i think it's just very flawed um way of living yeah i like the way you said touch wood there i'm not sure if that was a Freudian slip or just <laughs> no just we do that quite a lot now it's incredibly <laughs> superstitious yeah. such mud in this case yeah exactly. um Nancy, what time do we have to finish up? What do you want to? Yeah, I'm just conscious of the time that we are <laughs> going to have to start to wrap up soon, but maybe just give Summer a chance to have any concluding remarks oh. or just anything you like. That's very kind. Thank you. Volume. I mean, I, <laughs> I already haven't got much more to add other than to say I'm very sorry about the glitchy pictures. That seems to be really annoying because about five really people beautiful. have commented. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I didn't see them, so I don't know. But it's a shame because uh, we chose the pictures mine. so carefully for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they they sort of resolved after a while. Okay. It was sort of a, okay. you know, it's kind of a, there's a sort of a peaceful defragmentation okay. going on. But okay. anyway, I'll send you the recording. Nice. And thank you so much. <laughs> then I can see um, how awful it was. <laughs> no, it was fine. It was fine. It was uh, kept us hooked. 
<laughs> nice. All right. no, it was it was a fantastic presentation. Thanks so much. I mean, like we said at the start, the work's so inspiring. It's um, you, you won't know this, but at, actually, my University of Melbourne, we have a farm, a whole farm called Dookie, a separate campus in the countryside, about two hours north of Melbourne, in the Victorian countryside. And I've been plotting for a while how do we make that a bio-based materials kind of production. Oh, that sounds so, great. That's my dream too. We're, we're looking for this. a farm. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it's enormous. It's got um you know it's got everything in it so um so yeah we might uh, want to pick your brains about that another time but um How exciting and I'll, I'll also send you there's this amazing book i read just recently just while we're on called imperial mud which i'll send you a link to as well which yeah, cool it's about the fens in the east of england and the kind of the finish oh, that there and that sort of local craft traditions and so on so so anyway that you've inspired great. us to sort of dig into mud to uh, investigate victoria's own ecosystems here we've got some really rich ones so thanks so much for your well, time. thank you for, thank you for having me